This conference will now be recorded.
हेलो हेलो हाय गाइस गुड मॉर्निंग ललित या मॉर्निंग सॉरी फॉर द डिले या वी कैन स्टार्ट ऑल राइट so basically today will be our last session and we will try to wrap up all the things whatever we have done of course and we so will start as already started from 9 this will be till 7 pm <coughs> so what we have seen in the last section uh, the remaining part that we oh. used remaining i think we have completed the bpc uh-huh. all the submits private submits correct and then we have also seen the s3 correct ah uh, yeah lalit okay so i think there are certain parts of the s3 was left to configure the web hostings and all other configuration we have seen them basics only so let's start from the again from the same page we have started we have seen what is versioning we have seen the server access logging and the static web hosting correct when i click on the static web hosting it shows us a page that all the information about which is stored on that our st bucket the static the static website only and uh, it, lalit oh, one minute uh, okay uh, your voice is a bit low okay uh, give, give me a second okay sure Uh, ah, yeah, yeah, Lalit, please. Okay, can you hear me loud and clear? Ah, uh, still not so clear. Is your mic nearer, like? No, from my end, it's perfectly fine. The network bandwidth and everything is fine. Okay. Okay. Shall we start, or do you want to do some yeah, correction? Wait, wait. So he's connected. No, no, I only connected. I only connected. I think he said no. Okay, just connect once. Hello, Lalit. Hello. Yeah. Is the yeah. sound clear? Okay. Yes, sir. All right. <laughs> so we have seen all the things: the versioning, access, server access logging, and static web hosting. Now, if you see, mm-hmm. there are other few services, a uh, few configuration that you can do, like encryption on a particular on a particular object. You can encrypt or log in the futures. You can also enable this object log. but as we already started this part object log can be only enable by creation of a bucket by creation of the bucket only you get that option to enable this object log if you try well after doing after creation of this bucket you won't be able to do that as it says object log can be enable only when a bucket is created so by creation of bucket only you need to do this now we have tags Now, not like the our tags on our EC2 machine or the VPC and other AWS services, which were free. AWS S3 tags are chargeable because this is a global service, and your buckets are also global, are also globally unique. So, whatever the tags you will do, whatever the indexing you will find to search a particular tag, 
that will cost a lot so aws charges for the tags that you define here all the services on the aws tags are absolutely free except s3 so you can write a tag whatever you want key and the value uh, do you guys know aware of the json language or the yama language uh jason yes you know jason yeah jason all right so today we will see the cloud formation one of the aws service in that part we will require a json all right okay so now then we have a transfer acceleration now if you remember what is transfer acceleration is basically a service that helps you to upload the data quickly across the globe which means let's understand a scenario where you have designed your infrastructure in Mumbai. All right. But now you have clients which are situated in US, UK, Australia, in different, different locations. And these people are trying to upload the data on your bucket, a very huge amount of data. So uploading a huge amount of data on your S3 will take a lot of time as they need to travel. All the data needs to travel from hopes to hope from US to India. So when you enable this transfer acceleration, it basically uploads the data to its regional location or is to its regional data center. And from this location, the data is being securely moved to your ST bucket. So now this US people will upload the data to its own regional location. And then the data will be delivered to your bucket in Mumbai region securely via AWS private link. So in this way, the capacity and the bandwidth to upload the data will be faster compared to related non transfer acceleration service. You can click on and see the transfer rates here. It will take few seconds, few minutes to check out the speed of a current location in all the regions. Now it's there. So it will now test the speed, the upload speed and the download speed. Now the upload from a direct upload speed and upload when you do uploading via CloudFront technology, that is via each location. So it checks in both the way. And from an average utilization, average speed, this Singapore region is 72% faster currently. So now it will check all other different regions and whenever you enable people from this location will get and upload the data in much faster way. So it will take a lot of time now to do all this calculation. We'll just keep it pause so that we can see at the end how this acceleration process works. And enabling this option will also cost you extra. That is you use new accelerator endpoint for faster data transfer which will incur an additional fee. So to, and when you enable this option, you will get extra charge for accessing the services. Then we have events. Now event is something that if anything occurs on your ST bucket, then an event will be triggered. Now this occur may be a new bucket is uploaded, an existing bucket is deleted or any object is deleted, modified, there are a lot of events that you can configure and anything if happens on this bucket, you will be get notified for that. So how it works, you need to just click on add notification. That is, you can add multiple notification if you want on each folder level, on each bucket level or each on specific type of the bucket file, you can process this event notification. Let's say notify when image is uploaded all right so i click on put i have just given name image is uploaded and now let's say my images folder is image and inside this folder if anything happens if any kind of file is uploaded with png document 
then it will throw us a notification now what kind of notification do you want do you want an SSS notification that you need to get notified by email via lambda function or via uh, SMS what are the different platform that you want to configure you can do this or via SQS if you want to process this data into further processing you can pass it in a SQL system or if you want to process on a backend system on a computing machine then you can go with the lambda function now as you know that we haven't touched any of this part we don't know what is SNS or SQS or lambda how it works and anything so we will skip this part for this moment and next point we will see the application services and then we will jump back to this position and we'll configure an S3 endpoint all right so I just skip for this moment so what is events now coming to the permissions here we are accessing the public access here we are blocking all the public access that is if you are doing any access control list if you are trying to give access via this access control list option then this access control list here is blocked this two sentence define the blockage of this access control list and the two other define the access control list via a bucket policy so this kind of bucket policy restrictions you can do at the public bucket level now access control list is just similar to our vpc network access control list what happens in our network access control list is once you do any kind of configuration there the entire subnet will take into action for example on a subnet if there are 10 ec2 machine running at port 80 that is from http this 10 ec2 machine is running and if i click on NACL rule and if i enable a rule that deny all the 80 port on this particular subnet then this all the 10 ec2 machine will not be able to get any request from 80 port though your server is running though you have allowed in the security group but this knackle rule will take into action at the subnet level on which this 10 ec2 machine was designed so similarly to that part we have access control list at the bucket level now this what it offers you is you can give access to another aws account you need to just click on add account give the 12 digit of account id here and what are the permissions that you want to give you can specify here that is list only object write object read bucket permission write bucket permissions what kind of actions you want to provide you can give here you want to make it the entire bucket public then you can just click on everyone and give the permission now if you remember our first section then we have seen different kinds of buckets a bucket in which objects can be public the entire bucket is public bucket and object are uh, public uh, and error yeah uh, Lalit, uh, one question here uh, just yeah. for the clarification uh, since we are talking about the s3 bucket right so one thing right. is making it as a public and one is uh, you know managing through the access uh, control list so okay. the the option the access control list is to manage the s3 bucket uh, within the aws console right it's more of like you know let's say we uh, we have two three different accounts and within the uh, different users we want to share the uh, you know the s3 buckets you know to read and write the files and that's where we are going to use and the public when we make that the public means outside the aws you know someone really wants to access our uh, the files uh, through http url uh, then uh, the public permissions comes into picture correct absolutely when you want to share with between two aws account you give access control list to another aws account and when you want to share the entire bucket publicly you make it public okay okay uh, just you know i'm not sure like i'm raising one more question here uh, maybe you're going to cover in uh, today's session or uh, i'm not sure uh, just i want to uh, know uh, let's say if i want to expose the files which are there on the s3 bucket to the public okay there is two way of accessing one i'm going to access that files directly let's say you give a url using that you know i open that and down, download that particular file one one way is that 
or else if i want to programmatically access that still you prefer to go with a uh, uh, http url or else uh, should we write some sub, some sort of a uh, uh, custom uh, rest api using that uh, uh, you know our uh, the customers will access the files to the api thing instead of http url all right so you, you got my question if you want to access the data of you know, which is inside in the bucket there are different ways to access the data let's say if the place from where you want to access data is it from the s3 or is from the your aws account maybe one of the ec2 machine or the elastic beanstalk or other aws services then you don't need to give any permissions here what you need to do is you need to just create an im role for that once you provide the im role all the data will be delivered to that machine if the the from the place there from where you want to access the data is outside of your aws account then you will probably require an access key and the secret key to configure and then you will be able to get the data via api calls uh access key in the uh, yeah we have seen this access key and secret key in our im section if you remember yeah that is for accessing the resources like like ec2 or anything like on the instances no, we no, will be using to all, the, to all the services even if you want to see the data inside the s3 bucket you can configure okay so in that case uh, do you prefer like if someone uh, i'll give you an example i'm working with one of my partner okay uh, i'm going to share only one of the uh, s3 bucket with him and the, the, the like let's say i'm going to share the video files to him so the preferable method is you know just you know go there and create some you know private key you know uh, the access key to them and you know allow them to access uh, through programmatically inside their program that is the easiest way to do or else uh, uh, even can we follow the api method we will write some sort of a api uh, using that they will access the uh, the files from our right three bucket okay so here one thing needs to be understood so even if you create an api from which the data needs to be accessed at that time again the api needs to get permission to access the s3 correct there also you need to provide yeah, that is within the our account only yeah yeah so what we are trying to achieve with the same you don't need to create our api the api is already your im api so how you do this you create an im user and you specify the permission to have access to the s3 for a particular bucket let me just show you you can just create a policy to the service as all right and from this st you can specify the permission that you want to give to this user uh, let's consider that all the permissions you want to describe and here you can specify the bucket arn so in our case if i want to share with you this aws account only for this bucket on if if i want to share only this bucket then what i can do is i just need to copy the arn at click on review policy give a name as 3 access to one bucket now uh, you click on create policy right so next time will be create a user and attach this policy so now what will happen to the end user what you need to do is the access key and secret key so this guy will log in via this access key and secret key and this guy will be only eligible to watch the data inside that particular bucket not the entire buckets in your aws account did you get this method it's the same way as creating an api from outsider like if they want to access this programmatically then they will use this uh, here and uh, no they use the access key and secret key they can log in via CLI or AWS console, whatever the permission that you will give. And through that, they can have access to only a particular bucket data. Okay, what if, if they want to uh, access some folder range uh, in the date range and all? 
should they go to like each folder and uh, browse through recursively and identify that or else uh, can we write some sort of a query against the file system for example uh, like, i'll tell you an example uh, let's say i have a 2019 folder inside that each month wise i have you know the files been stored all right now i want to access only the 2019 may and june uh, files now okay. instead of i go to the s3 folder and browse uh, through each and every folder rather than that can i write uh, any write uh, you know the query where i can fetch the files only from those two particular folder programmatically right. now again you don't need to do anything what you can do is in the existing policy just click on edit policy and here you can specify the path for example inside your bucket it will be 2019 and maybe may month and dot star so inside this may month you will get whatever the data is present you will get access let's say there are two or three months that you want to give access so what you can do is you can write multiple strings here and this time you say maybe may june so only to this folder the person will be accessible may and june data You can here follow also, the folder. And also, Lalit, uh, we can even uh, uh, remotely we can update these resources also, right? Using the uh, AMI, uh, IAM right. uh, integrations. Yeah. So you mean uh, they want to query by the the SID, yeah? No, oh, sorry. Sorry, S3 resources. Hello, pardon. Yeah, and I'm, I'm trying to understand the resources here. So, how the query is going to be made? They are going to access. Uh, now, whenever they are going to access these resources. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. So, whenever this user will access via access key and secret key and to log in when uh, in your ST side, only the data which is present in 2019 May month, that data will be shown, and in the June month. what you can do is if you want to see how it works and all you can just simply create an im user and give this kind of permission and once uh, once you give the permission just log in via this user and try to see the aws console you will get the data but, but this is a pre defined style now uh, lalit this is something like already i defined it uh, because uh, you know that when some user wants to really access that he is going to make the call at the time of uh, usage right Let's say he wants to see the month uh, January or maybe December. Uh, we cannot keep defining the way the user looks into the file now. Then you can just keep the 2019. So now then you can sort it out based on the formula. Uh, you can use the lambda function. And if a user wishes to access the only June month folder, then the query will send, and you can change the path to June. What I can recommend to you is to write a lambda code. and in this lambda code a uh, user will fire a query that he wants he wishes to see the data from the june month so if he wishes to watch the data from the june month this string will be generated 2019 slash june slash star and all that content of this data on in this uh, folder will be presented in front of him so now the pulling of the data will be job done by the lambda function not by the user 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 will fire a query to the lambda function define the month uh, of which data he wants to wish and lambda will fire a query based on this data based on this queries we are we are able to even uh, get the available uh, subfolders subdirectories in the bucket right using the query uh, using the apis boot apis or uh, cwi apis yeah so technically now your lambda function will have a full permission to the s3 but then you need to define a logic in the way that you want to get the data if you want to get the data from 2019 folder inside june then that logic needs to be created inside the lambda function so that it will easily scan the files and pull the data from that particular month on <laughs> so ideally uh, we can do most of the stuff through lambda functions only rather than we write some sort of uh, apis from the outside as no yeah you can do 
and uh, you can easily invoke the lambda function from outside the AWS. So it yes, just like that can be done externally as well as uh, from outside also, na? Yeah, it's like more it's like, like my partners yeah. also can you know access my lambda functions. Right, right, of course. Mm, then uh, the lambda function itself has act as a you know the API methods na in that case. Yes. Like uh, when we write any API, you will have some sort of function input and output parameter, and it queries internally and gives the output to the outside user. Rather, the same function can be done through the lambda in that case. Right. Absolutely. Even the through APIs also, we can do all of this uh, using the Boto APIs. Also, we can list the available folders, right? Yes, of course. There are a lot of uh, things that you can do. Even you can write your own program. That will fetch the data based on the user's logic on the month, and it will uh, pull the data from S3 and show to the user. Like you have your own uh, client console, right? Uh, application console through which a user will select the date and time, and the data will be pulled from S3. For example, if you want mm -hmm. to understand, let's say you are using a net banking site, and you want to fetch a logs of all the transactions made in the June month. Now all this log, all this data will be stored on the S3. Okay, so from your net banking side, you will just select I want to see the data from the June month. Okay, so what is the logic will be generated, and this logic will pull the data from the S3 of that June month. It's similar to that, so you can have your custom console, you can design your own custom client, or you can use the AWS Lambda for that. Yeah, so one more uh, question, Lalit. Uh, yeah, very generic one. So in that case, uh, on cloud, if we are you know, designing any application, the whole idea is that uh, if you look at this serverless technology like Lambda, so we don't require any uh, API kind of uh, design at all, right? Because uh, the Lambda will take care of that. You can write all your Lambda function, just expose it. And now say the people can access the data securely through Lambda function itself. Rather, we go ahead and uh, write some APIs, host it on some EC2 instance, and expose it out, you know, to the outside world. Yes, of course. Which one is the preferable uh, method, you know? Yeah, you can go. Of course, but the limitation of Lambda is it can contain only the logical and the business logic only. You cannot represent here anything. It cannot be used for the front end. Cannot use for front end. Whatever the presentation you provide, the graphics and all the things for that purpose, you cannot use Lambda function. Lambda is only used for backend purposes for logic designing, business logic, etc. Uh, so you mean to say from the any web application through programmatic, I cannot directly call the Lambda functions to fetch the data. No, of course you can do that. But as you can see, what I mean to say is. See, now this is a, your AWS console, right? This AWS mm -hmm. console is also working on the Lambda function. Okay, so whenever I click on, I search here a bucket, let's say ISL global. Let's say whenever I search, it hits to a Lambda function and Lambda function will respond to this data. What is the name of the bucket which is having a ISL? So this queries can be fired from a Lambda function, but the overall data that you see here, the design of this web page, Amazon S3, AWS Data Sync Automate, this kind of features is not possible on the Lambda. This is your front end, this is your presentation layer. This presentation cannot be done on the Lambda. For that purpose, you will require an EC2 machine. Did you get that? Lambda functions can be only used for the backend purpose. So what if you explain more about your client problem then we can go ahead for that. Uh, okay, I think you know uh, let's close the topics what has to be there probably I'll write down the query in the next sessions you know we can uh, deep dive into that and get into that like, because uh, if we continue with this now we may not be able to cover the other aspects yeah so exactly. i have you know, a couple of questions though uh, so let's go by and cover the topics uh, so let me prepare my questionnaire and you know maybe 
end of day we will continue to work then we can uh, discuss on the next session uh probably this is really our last session of our course and today mm -hmm. we are covering all this part okay uh right. fine then either way like you know i'll talk to shivam on the other line uh please you know just go ahead and you know, cover these topics huh? yeah all right so access control is more like sharing your bucket with another aws account or giving them public access whereas the bucket policy now you can define who can access to your data inside this bucket for example i have made the entire bucket public anyone on the internet can just visit to my aws s3 bucket and check out all the data that you may need to download all right but i need to preserve this kind of condition from being accepted let's say a user can only visit to my data they cannot download the data they cannot write any kind of data though the entire bucket is public but they are not allowed to write or modify the data so for this purpose i can write a policy for that that restricts all the actions made on the my bucket or let's see another example i have made the entire bucket public that is a file can be accessed from http as well as https as i can if i click on images and if i wish to open this file then i can see this logo from https that is https here and if i remove this http i can still see the data it says no not secure but i can still see the data if i want to restrict this part then people should only connect to my site connect to my data from only https not from http that also i can do at the bucket level let me just show you that example i will write a bucket policy if you don't know how to write a bucket policy you can use this policy generator here you can select as the bucket policy and i select deny principle will be all that is all users from the internet and actions let's say get object get object arn now i will add a condition that bool if i want to have a secure transport of my data and value should be false add a condition so now what will happen if a request is coming from https then only it will allow otherwise it will deny so what it says this is id this is a version which is defined by the aws and here start our statement so the first statement says the action to be made on the get object effect is denied if on this arn that is our uh, bucket policy our bucket if the secret transport needs to be false that is if a request is coming from http it should be denied if a request is coming from https then it should allow principle is all that is anyone from the internet let me just write and update this policy we'll come save okay now let's access the same file again from http as http and it says access is denied but if i add https then i can access the data so now the entire site is my secured if you want to access my site from https then only you will get my data otherwise you are denied to access my data so it's like a more secured way of transmission of data you can apply so, so similar to this there are a lot of features available on which you can access the bucket policies and everything let's say uh, this is one of the statement i can write another statement that defines restriction from another aws account to accept the data that is to one of your aws account you can just 
uh, you can get my data you can do you can download the data you can write the data but you cannot upload your own data to my bucket i want to restrict people to upload the data to my bucket i can write another policy and it will affect on the bucket level so all these permissions you can do at the bucket level then we have management that is life cycle management a life cycle management is basically transition of data from one source to another that is from one storage class to another from standard storage to infrequent from infrequent to glacier etc all this life cycle you can check it so can you give me one good example of life cycle where you can actually implement in real life anyone Life cycle for storage. Yeah, life cycle. Uh, documents. Uh, like exactly what? Uh, just a scenario, example. So whatever new documents approach is, we will keep it in the. What is the There is also one thing. Also, probably in uh, in some of the examples, if you are talking about the documents. Let's say uh, when you create a proposal, you know, the still, you know, uh, the business is not business is not converted though. Uh, like still, you will you will be keeping those files in the temporary folder. Then, you know, upon the approval, then you move to your particular folder, you know, to make sure that the business has been confirmed. Does Correct. it make sense, you know? Yeah, yeah of course. So as we have discussed, the, one of the example, like if you are trying to apply for a PAN card or Aadhaar card. Then definitely you can do with this online, you know, online. Uh, uh, you can just go to online application and fill your form, and you can do. Now, of course, when you're doing this kind of things, you need to upload your document, the date of birth proof, your address proof, etc. So let's say, and to each process, this application it takes seven days to fifteen days or thirty days. And daily, on and if we consider the infrastructure at the government side. Then from a single city, there are multiple applications are coming. So there are hundreds of uh, cities available in India. So from all the cities, when there are multiple data, multiple applications every day is generating. So we can consider this millions of users are creating this applications. They are accessing this application. So at the time, designing and understanding this kind of large infrastructure, huge infrastructure, at the time we need to consider all this option. So let's say today. When I uploaded all my documents to create a PAN card or Aadhaar card, so these documents will be uploaded in Amazon standard because this data needs to be accessed every time to process the application. The validators people will access the data, will check validation, will do the validation, and all this process. So let's say for the first 30 days, once the upload data has been uploaded, it will be in the standard one. And definitely, uh, this kind of companies gives a guarantee that. Uh, you know, within 30 days, 15 days, you will get your PAN card. So, once this data is uploaded, once this, this process is done, then this data can be easily moved to the infrequent access. Because this is the government side, you need to keep all the data. It doesn't matter how, whenever a user can ask for the data. So, let's say after 30 days, this data will be moved to the infrequent access for the next another 30 days. Maybe for some reason, maybe for the another correction, the user might regenerate the application. For that purpose, the documents will be required again. And once this process is completed for the next 60 days or 90 days, then we don't require this application. This application is considered to be the successful application. But again, as a government side or any customers or any private companies, they still require to save the customer's data. So at that time, we can move to the glacier. So in case if a customer comes again to request your data to process the applications once again, then you can just request the data from the AWS Glacier and process the data. So you can keep a lifecycle management that once a request is completed, once a request has been brought into the picture, it is moved from standard to infrequent, from infrequent to the Glacier. And from this entire process, you don't need to do any kind of job. Everything is done by the AWS, this lifecycle. And through this, you can save your cost. Because if you compare the cost of a standard infrequent and the glacier, you will find a difference, huge difference in the pricing option. 
So that's why you can use this uh, lifecycle management in your production account. So let me just create a rule. So let's say test rule. And prefix I will not give prefix, I will I want to do it on the entire bucket. If you want to do on a particular object or particular folder, then you can specify the folder name. Next, where do you want to do this? Do you want to do on a current version or the previous version? Which one you want to go? So you can do it both or single, whatever you want. I will say current version, add transaction. So currently our data is in standard. Let's go to the standard infrequent access. The minimum duration is 30 days. You need to keep your data in the standard one for minimum 30 days. If you say 29, this is not accepted. The minimum duration is 30 days. Let's say after 30 days, move my data to the glacier. So the condition with the glacier will be the 60 days. Minimum is 60. So after 30 days, the data will be moved to the infrequent. And again, after 30 days, the data will be moved to the glacier. I want to do the same on the previous version. I can similarly, I can write a script here. Let's move to the intelligent tiering infrequent extra after 30 days. Next. Now the, here it comes the configuration expiration. That is, if you do not want this data to be long lasting available in your system, then you can delete this data automatically. So let's say to the current version, I didn't want this data after 365 days. After one year, even if I lose the data, it's okay. I don't require the data. So I can write a script. I can write again the lifecycle management that after 365 days, all my current version will be deleted. Similarly to my previous generation, previous version, I can say after 91 days, all the data should be deleted. So in this way, you can configure this part. Rex review and click on save. Okay, so this bucket is created, the whole bucket and this action will be applied. So in this way, you can create multiple folders, you can create multiple life cycles, and you can define on a particular bucket. If a data you on which you want to do life cycle on a particular bucket, then you can define multiple life cycle rules here on a different different bucket level. Then comes our replication. That is, do you want to maintain the same data copy into two buckets? Maybe uh, you have very critical data that you want to have a backup of your data always So you can create a like replication copy, but this replication copy has a condition That is you cannot replicate within the same region If you are replicating your data then it needs to be into different region As you can see here on the world map. There are two buckets in two different regions so it's called as cross region replication. Can you tell me the reason behind it? It's very simple. Why AWS says that you should do only cross region replication, not within the same region replication? Because physically two different locations, no? In the same data center, you don't want to have the same copy. Uh, no, the question is like, if you have two buckets in the same region, and then why can't you do the same replication into the same bucket? In the same region? into two different buckets there's a bucket a and bucket b in the same singapore region and if your data is critical then the bucket a data should be copied to the bucket b why this kind of is not uh, supposed to be a part of the aws replication and why aws says that the bucket replication should be 
within two different regions. Same thing. No, no, no DL yeah, thing. No, if something happens to the data center, both yeah. copies will go off. You know, you physically need to you know, keep that copy outside that uh, uh, the data center, right? Exactly. So if anything, because AWS gives you guarantee that your data will be available 99.99 percent. .99%. It has the availability and durability guarantee of 99.99 percent. .99%. So if anything happens, if your data is lost, then definitely the case will be the loss in the data center. There is some some misconfiguration in the data centers. Due to that only, you will lose the data. So in that case, if you have two replication copy in the same data centers, it makes no sense. So that's why AWS says to create a copy into another region. So yeah, you can create a rule. Then define, do you want to do on the entire bucket or do you want to prefer us on your particular bucket? Now with this replication copy, two limitations and two conditions are attached. First condition is both the bucket needs to be enabled for the versioning. Without versioning, you cannot transfer the data from one bucket to another bucket. Both the bucket must be enabled for the versioning. Second, second condition is to replicate the data the, from the moment you do this replication rule from this moment whatever the data you will upload that data will be replicated to another bucket the previous data which is already present in this bucket that data will not be replicated to the new bucket so if i enable this option now and if i try to upload some documents then these document will be up replicated to another bucket the existing data will not be replicated to the new bucket so these are the two conditions please note it down uh, it's a good point for the exam. You may get a question. One condition, both the bucket needs to be enabled for the versioning. And second condition, that the moment you enable this replication rule, from this moment, the data, whatever you upload, will be replicated to another bucket. All the existing data will still, will still in the same bucket only. So next, you can select the bucket from another region. There are a lot of uh, buckets. Let me do this on IntelliPer training demo July. And do you want to change the storage class for a replicated object? Like if you have a replicated, uh, if you have an actual, uh, you know, uh, data on the Singapore region, which is a standard storage class. And when you are replicating that data into another bucket in another region, do you want to change the storage class? So that you can do. You can go for the infrequent access. Next, define the role. Now here, to, for the transmission of a data from one bucket to another bucket, you need to create a role. So click on create a new role, give a name. Next, and save. So our bucket is IntelliPath and uh, our source bucket is ISL Kubler. Right. So if I go to that bucket, you can see that there are some logs and some data is already available. Let me just delete everything. All right. Now, if I upload anything on this folder, on this bucket, Then I can see here should be present in a moment. The same file is being automatically replicated to the another bucket, but not the existing data is to copy to this bucket. So this is replication of your data. Then you have your. Uh, you know, once you're done, uh, done with the duplications, then, uh, then after uh, whatever the files you're going to upload, that will be uh, reflected back to the, uh, the 
uh, bucket which is created, right? It has a reason. Sorry, I didn't get you once again. Uh, see, once you replicate it with the, the new bucket in the other region, okay, once the configuration is done, and after that, if you are going to upload any files, right, only those files is going to be replicated to the new bucket, right? Right. Only the new files, once uh, option is enabled, once uh, whatever the new files you will upload, those files will be uploaded to the replicated version, to the replicated bucket, not the existing bucket, not the existing data. If, if I want to uh, upload all the existing uh, data in the bucket, then you need to do this replication before you, uh, while after the creation of this bucket. Okay. Or once you are done with this uh, uploading the data and then you find out that you need to update that existing data to another bucket, then you can just write a policy. Uh, you can just write a Lambda function that will copy this data and upload to that another bucket. Okay. <laughs> so this is that you can use. That is analytics. Uh, now these analytics, metrics and inventory all are chargeable services. Analytics is basically that filters the and scans the entire bucket, how many utilization you have made, what is the get request and put request that you have done. Matrix will show the same in detail configuration, what, how many storage you have done, how many requests you are dating, and what is the data transfer between the services and from the user that you have used. So all this information in this way, you will find it here, the storage, bytes per day number of objects count per day the, the way that the count has been increased day by day you can everything watch in this matrix part now these are very highly chargeable so before you go and do all these things uh, just take uh, permission from your managers and everything and then you have inventory that is if you want to export this data into a report to showcase to your clients then you can request for an inventory which will take all the records from the AWS S3 bucket and then you can process this data. So this is all about S3. Any questions, any doubt in this part? Uh, me, uh, other than this IAM, uh, I think do we have any other way to access the files for it? No, unless you provide the permission to access the services, you won't be able to access any AWS services. Let's say I have created a user and to this user, I have not given any permission. Okay, now this user ID and password I have given to you. Will you be able to access my AWS services? Yes. Come on, I didn't get it. So, for example, I have created an IAM user. Okay. Okay. And this user credential I have shared with you. But to this okay. IAM user, if I am not attached any permissions, then will you be able to access this AWS account to any AWS services? No, I'm not able to access any AWS services. Exactly. So always you need to give the permission to the end users before you access the data before they access to the services. Okay. All right, so shall we move ahead to the next topic, our databases? Sure. The so first of all, we'll see the RDS. Amazon Relational Database Service. Amazon Relational Database Service is a service that makes it easier to set up, operate, and scale relational database in the cloud. So, in the same way that you access your database as of now, right now, in the same way you need to access the database. The only difference is in your on premise infrastructure, the database is been installed by and configured by you, which is nearest to available to you. And here on the cloud, this database is been created and maintained by the AWS. 
the difference is only that it provides cost efficient rechargeable capacity for an industry standard relational database and manages common database administration tasks now what makes a database to be a best part on the aws is its cost efficient technique and the rechargeable capacity this is something that you cannot achieve on an on premise infrastructure so what are the different types of database we have uh, we have in the rdbms that is a relational database system is a database system that is based on the relational model in which the data is in the form of tables and relations among the data which is also stored in the form of table like uh, you have a tables and then you have schemas and all the sql queries you enter the data you insert and you update this all this data we have a no sql type of database where this no sql database is basically a json type of document that matches a key and value name lalit age xyz whatever you have this kind of data you can write in the no sql format then we have hierarchical database kind of system in hierarchical database data is stored in a parent child relationship that is a fixed data store is available and based on this data the another data is been replicated or the another form of database is being created so it's like more hierarchical way and then we have flat file size of database there is no particular structure available stored in a uniform uh, form called flat file it can be a any json format it can be a csv file it can be any xml file whatever it is you can store a data into this kind of flat file now this is a very important architecture that you need to understand and you should always go for the production environment basically in the vpc part we have studied this multi availability zone correct what is multi availability zone guys anyone one of the aws is to go with multi ag so what is multi ag multiple availability zone yeah why why aws recommend that you should go for a multi availability zone uh, because uh, if uh, sometimes if in one uh, because this availability zone will be in different uh, maybe countries or anything no i have i have to you have to provide the high availability we will require a multi availability zone but even if you go for that what benefit you will get load balancing load balancing can be done even in the single availability zone also you can go for a network based load balancing okay. so what is basically an availability zone let's start from the basic what is availability zone where physically you know the data you know sits inside the database like maybe on the physical location of the data center correct it's a data center now what is a region a region is nothing but a geographical location in which there are multiple data centers are available so yes. example in india region in mumbai region we have three data centers that is three availability zones availability zone 1a availability zone 1b and availability zone 1c correct what purpose it serves is to have a multi availability zone that if any of this availability zone goes down if any of this data center goes down then we have another data center on which our resources will be uh, keep running up and running so that our infrastructure will know and never will go down correct in this way we can achieve the high availability is it fine now this is very important to remember this is the basics of the aws and on this you will get a lot of questions in the exam high availability all right so now 
Amazon RDS multi ability zone deployment. So the purpose of having a high ability on our EC2 machine, we have already studied how we can achieve that and how we to configure that using auto scaling subnets and using load balancers. But now it comes to the RDS part. So in RDS also, we can have multi EC deployment. So what will happen? There will be a two subnets. There will be a two ability zone. Now you will create a database in one of the ability zone and the same data will be replicated into another ability zone. That is, you will have always a master copy. Your data, whatever you write, that data will be written into your master copy. Then this master copy will synchronously replicate the data which is present in the master copy to the slave copy. Now the tricky thing is, AWS will create this slave copy and will keep hidden from ourselves. You cannot have access to the slave copy. You cannot see this slave copy. What you can see is only this master copy, whatever the interaction you want to do, that will be done on this master copy. So whatever the upload, insert, delete, or selection, whatever the kind of rules that you will pass, that will be done on this master copy. And this master copy will replicate the data to the slave. So what is it then use of this slave copy if you cannot see them, if you cannot visit this? So basically, again to serve the high ability purpose, if one of this data center goes down, let's say this ability goes down, then definitely this database will also go down. So at that time, what will happen? The endpoint of this master node will be detached and then it will be attached to the slave copy. Once this AW identifies this ability zone is down, so this database endpoint will be detached and attached to the slave copy. So now whatever the transaction that you are having, update, insert, delete, that instruction, that uh, all this communication will be done on the slave copy. So there will be no downtime or less downtime comparatively. So this is called as multi easy deployment. In this multi easy deployment, only the endpoint will be transferred from one end to another end until this master becomes again active. Once this begins becomes active, again the endpoint will be shifted. So this is multi easy deployment. All right. Any question, any doubt in this part? Multi easy deployment of RDS machine? No. Uh, what if uh, the master and slave goes off? Uh, Both the copies goes off, right? Yeah. So there will be a 99.9% of less chances of going both the data center at the same time down. But in case if it goes down in a hypothetical situation, then you cannot do anything. Then you need to wait until the AWS recovers the data. Okay. Now we have a redeplica. A redeplica is another one of the massive introduction by the AWS in terms of giving high availability to your data in multiple regions. It helps in performance increases and in for disaster recovery. So what basically a read copy is, whatever the master copy you have, this master copy will replicate its data to a smaller copies. Now these copies will be only used for reading purposes. Now uh, your user, your clients can have a write introduction and write the data to the database and also can do the read from the database, correct? So whenever this kind of actions, this kind of request is coming to the server, the server will identify whether it's a read request or read request. If it is a write request, then the write request will be made to your master copy. And if it's a read request, then the read request will be sent to the read copies. So let's assume a scenario. You have designed your infrastructure in Mumbai. All right. Your database is also in Mumbai. Now you have created multiple read copies. That is read replica. Now this read replica is present in US region, in UK, in Australia, in Singapore 
in different different regions you have created the thread copies now every time your clients will write the data to the master copy this data will be replicated to all the read copies so in case now if a us customer request to read any data then this data will not go to the master copy this data will be copied from the its original location of the read copy so having 1 million of requests on the master node now you will have only write request on the master node and all the load will be delivered to the read copies so in this way you can reduce the size of your server and you can increase the read copies correct did you get this read replica technology yes all right so it relieves the pressure of your master node and give additional it brings data to the close to the different regions like if you have multiple customer located in different different regions then it brings the data and close to your customers and it's the database is like uh, sorry to interrupt hello yeah yeah, yeah one question uh, since the second point you said uh, you know uh, it brings the data close to your application in different region so yes. this read replica it automatically uh, you know directs the closest region or we need to assign yes you need to assign the region in which where you want to create a read copy okay so wherever the wherever we find the lesser hop we have to design in that way yes for example if your customers are located only from us region then you should create a read only in us region so what if uh, multiple people are uh, accessing from multiple region can multiple replica can create it? yes yes you can create five different read copies of your database okay so limitation is only five huh? yes for the if you go for a mysql ogr sql or mariadb kind of database then the uh, the condition is only five read replicas but if you go with amazon aurora then you can create 15 read copies okay 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 thank you Right. So let's see what are the different engines available on the AWS. You have Aurora. Now Aurora is something that is Amazon designed database engine. It's just an engine, not a database. It's just an engine that supports MySQL and PostgreSQL. SQL. Then you have open source databases like MySQL, PostgreSQL, SQL and MariaDB. And then you have commercial databases like Oracle, Microsoft SQL Server. These are all the managed services that AWS RDS offers you currently by the AWS. If you are looking for another different kind of database like the MongoDB or anything extra, then you need to go again for Amazon EC2. You need to run the system there. So what is Aurora? How it is different from a normal MySQL machine? So when you go for Aurora, Aurora is basically designed by the AWS with machine learning technique and parallel execution flow. So with this technology, it gives up to five times the throughput of a normal MySQL machine and three times the throughput of your PostgreSQL SQL machine. So here, the performance is increased. When you go for Aurora, you can increase the performance. So can we do like this? If you have a MySQL machine with let's say T2 X large, then you can go for a Aurora with a T2 micro also. Yes, can we do this? Instead of when you are having a normal MySQL machine with a T2 X large, can we go now with Amazon Aurora in a T2 micro? Yes, of course, sir, because the throughput is increased here. Yes, exactly. The throughput is increased, so the performance is increased. Now we can save the cost by decreasing the size of a instance stack. So it supports up to 64 terabytes of auto scaling SSD storage. In case if you want to auto scale, then the size can be increased. It includes six way replication across three ability zones. So it maintains the multiple replication of its database into multiple ability zones. 
in case the data center goes down and it has a replication policy that will automatically replicate and recover that your data. It supports up to 15 read replicas with sub 10 milliseconds of replica left. So shifting of data from master node to the read copies, it will take 10 milliseconds of replica lag. And in case of failure of this Aurora, it will automatically detect and will create another RDS machine within less than 30 seconds. So this is more performance wise and more productive way of going to the RDS machine rather than going to the normal MySQL and RDS machines. So if you go for a normal MySQL server, it supports up to six terabyte of data storage. And currently, uh, the instances are offering more than 96 virtual CPUs and 700 and 900 gigs of RAM. It supports automated backup. Now, automated backup and point in time is a great future offered by the AWS. Just try to think about it. If you want to do the manual backup things of your database, how tedious this job can be. Karen, have you ever taken a backup of your database? If you have taken this kind of backup of your database, then you might know that how tedious this job is, how difficult that job is to take a backup. And if you want to restore the database, how difficult that becomes. So with this yes. Amazon, you don't need to worry about at all. Within only a few clicks, just take a backup and click on the recovery. Within only two to three clicks, you can store restore your database there. It's one of the great achievement made by the aid of this in terms of backup and recovery. It also supports cross agent red replicas. That is, we already discussed the red replicas that you can create in multiple regions. And you can create a red replica of red replica. The condition was five red replicas you can create. Now you can create a red replica of another red replica. So you can you can multiply the five red replicas into another five red replicas. And as MySQL servers are free, this is our license free. So this comes with free tier eligible. Now the same things with the MariaDB, there are different sizes are offered, and it is also free tier eligible. And same as a OCRE SQL. All these three databases are free to use. Then we have Oracle database. Now this Oracle database requires a license. Oracle and My Microsoft SQL Server. Both will require license. Now what AWS offers you is you can bring your own license. That is B Y O L. Bring your own license or you can let Amazon to buy it for you. So there are two types of licensing option. First is B Y O L and second is let Amazon to buy a license for you. Bring your own license and let Amazon to buy a license for you. So you can choose one of these options. Now, if your company is already having an on-premise infrastructure, which they want to move to the AWS, that is for the migration of your database, definitely they will have a license. So at that time, you don't need to purchase an, another license. You can just use the same license to create a RDS machine on the cloud. <clears throat> Here comes to our automated backups. Yeah, that Lalit, is uh, one small. Hello. Lalit, yeah, yeah. Uh, sorry to interrupt. On the licensing part. Yes. Hello. Yeah. On the licensing part, my my in general, if I want to buy it uh, on prem, my skill enterprise is a license edition. Yes. Because it is taken over by uh, Oracle. So. Yeah. Do we get the same? All the features of uh, MySQL on the free tier? No, my Microsoft SQL Server doesn't come with free tier. No, my, I'm not talking about Microsoft SQL Server. MySQL. MySQL Enterprise my is now taken over by Oracle. Hello? 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 Can you hear me? Yeah. Uh, yeah, currently, my, is, MySQL, currently uh, MySQL Enterprise. Your voice is breaking. Hello? 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 
Hello, your voice is breaking. Now you are able to hear me? No, I can. Okay, uh, you can continue. Maybe I'll note it down, and uh, probably after the session we can come back to this question. Hello, can you hear me now? Loud and clear. I can hear you. All right. Yeah, what we are asking? See, uh, currently, uh, MySQL Enterprise is taken over by uh, Oracle, and it's a license. So, do okay. we, uh, just want to ask uh, the MySQL what you are uh, mentioning here on free tire. Does it give all the features of your enterprise also? Yes, of course. It will give the same feature, but depends on the version to version. Now, I guess all the versions are not licensed. The previous versions are still free. The latest version will be licensed. Correct? All all license are uh, all versions are licensed. Currently, uh, the community edition is uh, free, and uh, the enterprise is uh, basically licensed. Okay. So okay. even I'm not sure about this. So we'll see this here only directly. Okay, no, next thing is uh, next thing is suppose if I ask Amazon to buy the license, uh, how yes. is the charges it is pay as you use or uh, it will be a one time cost? Uh, no, it will be pay as you go only, but depends on the server capacity. If you are running a server com continuously, then you need to pay for that. If you have stopped the machine, then also it will charge you. You need to terminate that machine. Okay. okay. Um, okay. Uh, just give me one minute. I will continuously get the replication from um, replication property. All right. So now we have an automatic backup. You can configure an automatic backup on the AWS RDS machine. Maybe in the night time when your servers and databases are down, when you do not require, when you have a low traffic, at the time you can configure this automatic backup. So every day, once in a month, once in a week, you can configure in such a way. And on this particular time, the automatic backup will be taken in place. Now you can schedule this raw data volume and you can even archive your database change log, whatever changes are happening, you can uh, create a database of that change log. The retention period is maximum up to 35 days. It's supposed only 35 days of retention period. Now you can just, if you still want to keep your data, then you can move to the S3. So with having an automatic backup, it affects minimal to your database performance in case of any disaster recovery or point in time recovery, you can easily pick the data and upload to the RDS machine. It is taken basically from the standby when the, in the multi ability zone. So whenever uh, this is in multi ability zone, this data shift standpoint shift to the another uh, slave copy and then the database copy has been made. When it comes to the Amazon Aurora, now this Amazon Aurora Replication is basically automatic, continuous, and incremental backup. Can you tell me what is incremental backup? We have seen this incremental backup in EBS. So it will take only the latest one. Yes, it will take the data change in the database. Right? So for example, Today you have a 10 GB of data. All right, 10 GB of data. You have taken a snapshot. Now tomorrow, let's say you have modified 2 GB of data out of this 10 GB. So in that case, 8 GB will be still the same data. When you take a snapshot B at this time, 8 GB of data will be referred from the snapshot A. And in this snapshot B, 2 GB will be added. 
the 10 plus 2 GB, you need to pay for 12 GB of data instead of paying for the 20 GB of data. So this is called as incremental backup. Now this feature is only available for the Aurora, not for the normal RDS machines. It again has the same features, no impact on the database performance and 35 days of maximum retention period. Now it also supports a manual snapshot. Even if you want to take a manual snapshot, you can just click on the database, click on manual snapshot and snapshot will be created. Now the last point is the security and compliance. This is a very important to cover and to make sure that your database is secure. So how will you connect to your database? Let's just understand a small scenario. You are having a three tier architecture. So in this three tier architecture, you will have one first tier, then you have a second tier, and then you will have a third tier. So the request will come to the first tier. It will be processed here in the first tier and the request will be sent to the second tier. Now, whatever the changes, whatever the thing that we'll do on the second layer, on the second tier, this changes needs to be written on the database. So the application tier will write the data to the database. So you should only allow in the security group that requests that are coming from the application security group is only allowed. No other request should be accepted in this databases. Correct. So what are the opens? What are the posts that you will open on the database side? That is if a request is coming from one of the application side, one of the application server, then only it needs to be accessed. Otherwise, all the requests are denied. Now, this is fine that regards from where the request is coming, this needs to be processed. But what about us? The one who has configured this RDS machine, we also need to have a permission to access this database. Correct? Otherwise, how we will configure our tables, how we will configure our database. So at the time you can open a ports to everyone from your organization that can access the data to the database from its local machine. So in this way you can configure. So this is your security code. In the security code, you can open the port. Now this is for the MySQL 3306. This is open to the range of your organization IP slash 32. Now slash 32 defines only one single IP. You can say 24 or 16 which will be entitled to your organization. And the second, if the request is coming from application tire, application security group, then this is allowed. So only two requests are allowed here. So let's say this is your VPC, you have two every zone. You have first year on which you have done auto scaling. Then you have second year on which again you have auto scaling. And then you have database. So actually request will come from front tier to middle tier and from middle tier the request will go to the master node and master node will replicate this data to the slave copy. So here from request will come to the front tier it goes to the back end and from here it goes to the master copy master copy will maintain the data to the slave copy. In case of master node goes down then this endpoint will be shifted to the slave copy. Any question, any doubt in this part? No, no. All right. And Lalit, one uh, question on the security part. Yes. Uh, see, basically, in some compliance of our security, uh, we cannot use a default port in the in the sense, uh, for example. Uh, Oracle uses 1521 port. Yeah. Uh, is it a way? Is there a way where I can change the port also here? Uh, no, you cannot. On uh, Amazon Managed Services, you cannot change that. Okay. Or that you need to go okay. for a custom one. You can also do it here, but that will require a lot of configuration. I'll show you. Okay. So this is okay. my AWS Management Console. And now before you go and create your RDS machine, one thing that you need to identify is your subnets. The private subnets or the public subnet where you want to create a snapshot, where you want to create your RDS machine. 
so just one minute so here is a default submit group available you can click on the submit group and the default submit group will be available so in your production account this default will be not available at that time you need to create your submit group that is you need to select the submit in which you want to create a database machine oh god so in which vpc you want to create let's say in my default vpc and all all the my submits now i have three submits out of this three submit in which submit i want to create my database so let's say i want to create in 172 31 32.0 and 16.0 in this two submit ap south one and ap south one c i need to create a database so i need to first create a submit group so once the submit group prod is created now you can click on the databases and you can click on create database here you can see what kind of database engine do you want to go you want to go with aurora mysql mariadb pogre oracle or microsoft sql you can choose one of this database engine and you can proceed so as we know this aurora is highly chargeable so and mysql is free tier eligible so we'll go with mysql only and suppose only mysql community as you mentioned it supports only mysql community which is completely free tier you can specify the version whatever you want to go there are a lot of versions available we'll go with any of this version and here comes our template so how you want to create your machine you want to have a production related machine in multiple ability zone or do you want to have a test test related uh, environment create a single machine for you or do you want to create a free tier that is it will create only one single machine for you so whenever you select a production one it means you are going for a multi easy deployment it will create two rds machine one will be hidden and second will be shown the db is the same let's go with the default one database one master username is admin password let's say now which ec2 machine do you want to go there are a lot of versions available but as you have choose the free tier so it shows only t2 micro only now you can as resource allocate for your ssd storage you can go minimum 20 gb to maximum up to 16 terabytes it can support up to maximum 16 terabytes you can go you can enable this auto screen if you want i don't want i can keep it remaining and here you select your VPC and the submit group. I will select the submit group, the one that we have just created, the prod one. And this is the option of public accessibility. Just similar to your EC2 machine, do you want to assign public IP or not? This is similar to that. So when you say yes, it means this RDS machine can be accessible outside of this VPC also. That is from your own computer. You can connect to this RDS machine and configure. But if you select no, then this will be your only private IP and you need to be accessed only from within the VPC only. You cannot access to this RDS machine from your local computer. So this is public activity, yes and no. So you can go with yes or no whatever or de depending upon your scenario then security group you can create a default security group or you can go with another security group i will go with another security group and say it's a database ig preference let's go with ap south one this is a port now if, in case if you want to change the port you can specify the port here if you want to go with 4000 port 600 port you can specify the port here and then you can click on create database now creation of this database will take a lot of time 
is currently creating and then it will be coming into available state and then we will be able to use this services so this is very easy to create an rds machine now once this database will be created you will get one endpoint this endpoint will be your host name or the local host whatever you say this endpoint you can use in your application layer or in your application to insert the data to update the data whatever you want to do there will be no ip address for accessing this rds machine there will be an endpoint and this is the database that we used to create for our rds machine so now what should be the inbound rules and outbound rules can you tell me what should be the inbound rules for this security group inbound rule I think both has to be restricted on specific port only. Mm, what port and uh, what should the, be the source? Uh, the outbound will be, I know, the uh, the public IP where uh, uh, it has to be given access with the port. And inbound. Inbound also all incoming traffic with the uh, specific incoming traffic with on the particular port we have to do it. Okay, so what from where our request is coming? Our request is coming from a private IP only. Uh, yeah, but from which uh, machine? From which security group? So as we have studied just now, we have a three-tier architecture: front end, back end. And then lastly, database. So of course, the request will be coming from one of the server. Yes. So can we just define the security group of those servers? Maybe it's the back end yes. server, maybe the front end server. So the source can be yes. that security group. Yes. So that's what we need to do. Now we need to just add it and define that particular subnet on which from which we have want to have communication. Maybe let's say from the back end we need to have communication so we just need to define the security group and click on save now any request that is coming from this security group from this ec2 machine those requests will be only accepted if a person is trying to do sql injection from the browser this kind of request will be not accepted this will be completely denied All right, so I hope now by this time our machine is created. Okay, still creating, it will take uh, five, 10 minutes, but still we are not getting any endpoint. So once you get this endpoint, you can include this endpoint into your application to make a connection request you can provide your username and password to have a communication all right then you click on actions here what options you have is stop reboot and delete in case if you want to stop the server reboot the server or delete the machine you can do you can take a snapshot or in case if you want to migrate the snapshot to another region in case you want to do replication into another region then also you can do there is also read replica options but we need to wait for that let's just wait for another five ten minutes
So what I'm trying to do is I will create a launch an EC2 machine and from this EC2 machine we will try to connect to an RDS machine. Correct. So what are the resources we will require in this RDS in this EC2 machine to connect to our RDS machine? The endpoint address. Uh, correct. Port. Port. Right. And the uh, security tool. Correct. Now we will require all this information and uh, to process this. We need to download. We need to install the system to make sure that the MySQL client is accepted. So here is a small bash script. This bash script, what it will do? It will install the Apache server, the PHP, and the PHP MySQL component, and then it will start the server and it will write the script uh, PHP info so that we can test our PHP is working fine or not. So once this PHP will be working perfectly, then what we'll do is we will configure a PHP connection string in our server and we'll try to test our connection. All right. I think this is very common and you guys know. So I'm we are providing the script add storage add tags. Mm, here I set the backend server on which 22 port. I'll just create a new server security group. SSH and HTTP both are allowed. Review and launch. Now, what are the configuration things that you need to do? Okay, I have logged into my server. Now, what will be the next step to write that bash script? Uh, to write that uh, connection string. So here is my connection string. The username will be the admin. Password, the one that I have set, one to three. Now we'll require an endpoint. So endpoint will be our database. And this is our endpoint. Uh, do you remember what is what was our DB name, database name? I forgot actually the name of the database. Do you guys remember the name of your database? Okay, our PHP file is working. Now, if I say database dot PHP file, the one that I have just created. D E D A T A B A C database dot PHP database dot PHP. So it is unable to connect to MySQL. Why? Any security group permission. Correct. 
I'm just security group. We need to change the permission and give to the application one. Security group, office server security group, the one that we have just created. We click on. Yes, I tried this. Refresh, retry. It says connected to the MySQL but unable to connect to MySQL database. Check the database name and type. So the connection between an EC2 machine and the MySQL is successful. But due to the uh, wrong name of your database, this is not accepted. I literally forgot the name of the database. I'm not sure. Last thing so anyway, you can have this communication from an IC machine when EC2 machine. Something with July. Previous one July. Day three July. Day three July. Day three July. Hello. <laughs> Yeah, do you have any questions? Can I search with the July name? Day three Sorry? July something. Database name. Uh, database name is I forgot. Do you remember? It contains July. Day three July or something. July. Yeah. Let's just paste it out. What it is, G U L Y, J July. Anything else? Day three. Uh, day three. 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 Day there's uh, options available, but it's not showing that part. DB name is not showing. DB name is DB name. So you, you mean to say that uh, you're referring to the database hyphen one, man? Huh? Yeah, database hyphen name is the name of the instance. The way that we give the name to the instance app server is the same name to the RDS machine. But here the data is in the I forgot to mention or I forgot the rem what okay, name then you, from the SQL you don't have any comments to like you know show DBs or something like uh, when you connect as an admin you should be able to list out all the uh, DBs inside that yeah, instance right yeah that part you can do of course uh, you can just use uh, my 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 SQL, uh, this is my SQL okay. you you try to show DBs uh, sorry yeah like instance anyway, you should be able to connect. Only thing is he does not know the database. Right? Yeah. Instance once you connect, you should be able to take out all the database. Right? Yes, I got your point, uh, Gopi. Yeah, you can just install mm -hmm. the MySQL workbench and then you can process all the databases installed in this system. Mm -hmm. Select star form and you can see the list of all the databases uh, which you have in this database. Of course, you can yes. do that. But, you know, but only for me, like if, being an outsider, if I look at that, uh, it looks very strange that AWS has not given that kind of an option to you know, look in uh, uh, you know, the user interface. You know, that, that's all. <laughs> Is there yeah. any specific reason for that? Or I'm not sure. Like it's more of a some, I don't know what exactly the, you know, the reason why uh, they are not showing that on the user maybe console. Maybe the system is under process. Maybe they are working on it. You will find, you will soon get all the details. In the future, so let me check if I can modify that part. You have a database engine version, multi ec deployment, storage, auto scaling, database instance identifier, new master password if you want to change. 
subnet security guard certificate authority and database port db parameter db authentication yes you cannot have that part while creation of the database only you need to remember this yeah, as you said, we, if we connect to that instance, we should be able to list out all the, uh, the DBs which are created under that instance now. Yes, yes. <laughs> let me know if you get any result. Uh, very I'm much, the, very much. You know, yeah. We will dig in further and find out if any options are there to see that. Sure, sure. Let me know also. Yeah, yeah. So now with this machine, you can stop, reboot, delete. You can create a red replica. Also, you can create a red replica in an Aurora machine. That also possible. You can take a snapshot. You can migrate the snapshot. You can restore the in any point of time. What is it? Aurora red replica. Okay, so we have different types of engine: Aurora engine, MySQL engine. The difference between an Aurora engine and a normal database engine is. Aurora engine is more powerful, it gives you more throughput option. And at the same time, it gives you high performance with the automatic backup, incremental snapshot, etc. So, in case if you want to create a, a replication engine, replicated uh, re replica of in an Aurora machine, then that feature is available. Okay. So, there will be fast variation with normal uh, RDS with Aurora and, and DB as well. Of course, of course, there will be. Mm -hmm. Now, currently we have in Mumbai. Now, where you want to create a re replica, you can select the region particular. Let's say in Frankfurt. You can select again, select the database subnet, already zone where you want to create this engine. You can specify the instance family that is T2 micro, T2 small, what kind of engine you want to go. You can specify all these different options and then you can click on create read replica. So a read operation will be only made to this read copy. Now, Amazon itself <coughs> determines if the request is the right request or the read request. If it is a right request, then the request will be made to the master copy. And if it's a read request, then the request will be sent to the read copy. Now, where you can you enable this option? Any real-time example where you can use this uh, read copies, read replica? Can we use in the WordPress site? Sorry, what is that? Can we use this read copies into a WordPress site? Uh, still not able to understand the question like you're linking the database with the WordPress. Yeah, like uh, so whenever we create um, a WordPress, yeah. Oh, WordPress is more of you're talking about content management tool, right? Reports for report maintenance. No, no, no. We are talking about the read replica, mm -hmm. but my question was where you can use this read, read replica in actual scenarios, in actual applications. Only data to fetch in the um, for reports. For reports, of course. Now, the report. yeah. So here is I have an application that is WordPress site. I have one WordPress site. Can I use this red replica copy in my WordPress site? Uh, no. It's not a great, there is one more technical term, no? Uh, what you guys are talking is hot and cold database and uh, from cold you want to access the no, uh, data from the... There will be a database and read, uh, read replica will be another database that on that database only the read operations can be done. Yeah, that is a cold one. Like hot is something like you're doing a lot on the transaction. But here he is uh, talking about a replica. Replica in the sense like, a, I believe you know you can connect to only one instance here, like even though you you enable the replica, that's a backend operation managed within the database engine. But still, from the application point of view, you will have a connection to the only one, uh, you know, uh, the, the instance. Probably instance or what what you call it, the technical term. Okay. So let's uh, deep dive into this. 
you have a WordPress site. So in this WordPress site, what data will be stored in the MySQL? You have okay. a blog. You are, you are having a one blog. So for blog is running on the WordPress site. So what data will be stored in the MySQL machine? What data will be stored in uh, MySQL? Yeah, all uh, the, no, the uh, data related to the application that goes to the same database, no? Content. Yeah, the content of the blog, correct? Yes. Okay. So my question is, if the content of the blog is been replicated to multiple regions, okay? Now, when we talk about the blog, a blog is something that is a static content that many user can see and can see the static content and read the data, correct? Basically, yes. it's a more like a read operation. Even if you go to the medium.com or the, you know, stack overflow, at this moment, you can just write the data, you can just read the data. So, if infrastructure is created, if a WordPress site is created by region and I have created a read data into a US region, the US people will be not able, the US people does not require to take the data from the Mumbai region. They can read the data from its nearest location. <coughs> so in that way, can we use read copies? Yes, we can use. Again, if uh, my uh, if my clients are located in UK, in Australia, in different different regions, I can again create a read class there. All right. So this uh, many companies, many uh, clients are using this kind of technology to replicate this data into multiple regions. And this is a common application. All right. So it's like 11.30. Can we take a 15 minutes break? You can have a just refresh. Sorry? Can we take a okay. few minutes? And then we'll sure, start. Sure. Yeah, yeah. We have
नहीं आ रहा बाबा मेरा ही पैसा आ रहा है सिर्फ मेरा ही पैसा आ रहा है आपका पैसा आ ही नहीं रहा है अकाउंट में
Hello. You guys there? Hello. 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 We do not have any lab session on this part. We'll just see the demo on how what, what are the description of this services. So starting with the DynamoDB. Amazon DynamoDB is a key value document database that delivers a single digit millisecond performance at any scale. So what AWS offers you with the DynamoDB is a single digit millisecond performance at any second. It can receive 1 million of requests per second and it has a capability to deliver the content with that request. It's a fully managed services. Now you don't need to create a database. You don't need to uh, install the DynamoDB. You don't need to configure anything. AWS is a managed services called as DynamoDB on which you can directly create a table. So it's again a serverless service. DynamoDB is completely serverless. It's a fully managed, multi-regional, multi-master database with built-in security, backup and restore. All the features that we have already studied is uh, the same features security, backup, restore, and caching, internet scale application, etc. Now, DynamoDB on the AWS can handle more than 10 trillion requests per day. It has the capability to scale and meet the requirement of 10 trillion requests per day and support peaks of more than 20 million requests per second. So, it is a very huge that a single dynamo db table can hold a request of 20 million requests per second so now when you compare about the scaling policy on a traditional infrastructure and an aws infrastructure usually we increase the size of a rds machine usually we increase the size of a database from a t2 micro maybe to t2 large or t2 x large to meet the, our requirement but with a no sql as there is no server available. So here, whenever a request comes to the DynamoDB, DynamoDB checks its shards. Now in this term is called as shards. A shard is nothing but a compute capacity. There's a small compute capacity available to each of this DynamoDB table. So whenever a request is coming, this compute capacity will help you to resolve the permission to resolve the, uh, the request and will deliver the content. Now, if it reaches to the threshold of that compute capacity, the number of requests that are coming, if it reaches to the threshold of the compute capacity, then this compute capacity will itself call another compute capacity and it will balance the load between two compute capacity. So it's like auto scaling of the compute capacity that is shards. So if the requirement again changes and again increases, the another shard will come into the picture and the load will be balanced between all the three different shards. If let's say again the requests are increasing, then another shard will come into the picture and the request will be responded back. And once the server uh, traffic is decreasing, again one of the shards will release and again, the shards keep reducing. So this is the concept behind going to the serverless. Now this is similar to your DynamoDB table, to the S3, to the Lambda function. Even if you are going for a Lambda function, then you need to always keep in remember that on the Lambda also, this kind of things work similarly. You will have multiple shards, and these shards will help you to execute your request made come to the services maybe your lambda invocation maybe your dynamo db invocation whenever you do this compute capacity will help you to resolve those requests so these are called shards or partitions now these are the features of a dynamo db that it is highly available it is multi-regional available 
with a single constituency and millisecond latency at any scale. It's a fully managed service within the AWS console. You can manage the entire DynamoDB table. You don't need to configure, you don't need to connect to this DynamoDB table to connect all these features. With the security group, again, you can secure your incoming and outgoing connections. And you can easily integrate with the different AWS services like Amazon Lambda, Redshift, S3, all the different services, whatever you have, you can easily integrate with these services. That is Amazon DynamoDB. Then we have Redshift. Now, before going to the Redshift, do you know the terms OLAP and OLTP? Anyone? What is OLAP and OLTP? Hello, am I audible? Hello. Yeah. Is, is it something like uh, we will be using it for analytics, you know, for data mining and those kind of stuff, you know, for data Correct. extraction, you know, processing and uh, to do this stuff. So instead of we directly deal with, you know, uh, thing we will work on the store data itself. Correct. So basically, it's like uh, when you're having a transaction with your database, right? Uh, read all this transition whenever you do is basically OLTP online transaction processing the DynamoDB the RDS machine that we have seen these all are OLTP based transition database system but now we have another system called as OLAP that is online analytical processing it is more likely on the historical data when you have a huge database already available on which you want to extract the data if you on which you want to do analytics on this data at that term, OLAP will come into the picture. So our RDS machine, our DynamoDB are OLTP, and now we have a Redshift, which is OLAP, Online Analytical Processing. So Amazon Redshift is a fast, secure, and scalable data warehouse that makes it simple and cost-effective to analyze all your data across your data warehouse. Now, how it is fast? That is, Amazon Redshift delivers a 10 times faster performance than any other database data warehouse because it uses machine learning, massive parallel execution technique, and columnar storage. Now, usually you have seen that in the RDS, we store our data in a row wise. Even also in the DynamoDB, we store in the data in our row wise. But when you upload your data on your Redshift, it changes the way of writing the data to the Redshift. The data is stored in a columnar wise. Second, with the technique of a parallel query execution, you will get a much faster data that you usually get in your data warehousing option. And we using this machine learning tactic, it synthesizes the query which is made by you and it processes the, with respect to the indices and the slices done by the operating system and the data warehouse. So with all these different options, machine learning, parallel query execution, and columnar storage of your data, it responds to your data, whatever the query you will fire, you will get much faster rate. Amazon Redshift is specifically designed for OLAPs. Now there are two types of Redshift that you can create. First is a single node, and second is a multi-node. A single is node is something that if your database size is, is less than 160 GP, then you can go with a single node Redshift instance. But if your node size is more than 160 GP, then you need to go with a multi-node kind of project. So what happens in the multi-node? There are two types of other nodes available. One is a leader node, another is a computer. Just like your EC2 machine and a load balancer. What load balancer does is, a load balancer takes all the requests that is coming to your server and then it distributes this load to the multiple server. That's what a leader node do. A leader node takes all the requests that is coming, it takes all the queries and then processes this queries to all the compute nodes. Now you can have multi compute nodes. So this compute, so this leader node will send all the queries to the compute node. Compute node will deliver the content to the back to the leader node, which will be showcased on the filter duration. Now, maximum on a Redshift, you can create 128 different nodes, compute nodes, and there are different kinds of versions available. 
just like in our ec micro machine we have t2 micro t2 large t2 x large there are also four or five different types of compute capacity available so you can go with one of the compute capacity and you can create a group of leaders so redshift is fast due to columnar storage technique multiple compression technique and redshift automatically distribute data and query across all the nodes so due to that leader node it automatically distributes the data across all the different nodes any question any doubt in this part dynamo db and the redshift uh, in redshift data cubes will be prepared automatically or we have to prepare data cubes uh, like in the columnar wise ah oh, yes yes yeah that will be done automatically when you upload a data that job is will automatically done Uh, so uh, one very generic question like it means uh, the redshift will be used only in the data warehousing or if i do some sort of uh, aml training only in that cases uh, we would be pressing the yes for the big data analytics and, and for all these different purposes you can go with the redshift only not for storing so, your production environment data you, the olap is not useful at the time okay okay so again if we we are talking about aml uh, uh, thing no is it something even uh, we can deal with the media data as well uh, with redshift like you know storing the video files image files and processing on that yes of course you can do that but uh, the way that the data is been processed and delivered to you it will cost you a lot redshift is not cheaper the redshift cost is very high and secondly you will just require to fetch a data from a redshift so redshift is more designed to find a queries to search into deep dive of a huge database and then find a query so for media processing when you have as only file which is stored on the redshift that you want to pick the file at that time this is not a cost efficient solution okay so it becomes like it's more of a the transaction and data can only be you know placed inside the redshift you know for the yes when analysis. you want to search a data with a high database storage like 160 of rds database uh, now consider this 160 gp of rds database storage so this is very huge now companies like alibaba india mart juststyle.com these companies database are very huge so they can use this kind of storage system to find a query to go into deep dive of this database and find the queries so for such kind of transaction you can go with data warehousing option okay all right yeah so that was our database section we have completed the storage and the database now comes our dns part so dns which is amazon called as route 53 what is which service dns dns now we know the compute services we know storage services we know networking services and together with all the services we can create a giant network correct but at the end of this day when you have a infrastructure definitely you will connect this infrastructure with one of the dns service with one of the domain maybe you have designed apple infrastructure maybe you have designed that any e-commerce site so at the end of this infrastructure once you have created you will need to configure the dns to map it all this infrastructure with your domain so that's what the route to take comes here a route to take is highly available and scalable name domain name system web services with route to take you can do three kinds of things you can register or transfer a domain name in example.com dot in you can purchase or you can transfer it to aws you can route internet traffic to resources for your domain and check the health of your resources for example you can easily register a domain if you want to buy a new domain if you want to transfer your existing domain to aws you can do both the things there are a lot of uh, sub domains available dot com dot in you can easily see the list and whatever you prefer you can purchase it from there amazon is one of the most top 
domain registrar company in this world it is a one of the giant domain registrar company so you will get much discounts and you the domain name system whatever you will get uh, this will have multiple naming servers so the more the name servers you have the more efficiently your site will work and the more fast the execution will be done so that's why you should consider amazon web services to register your domains now with this route 53 you can also route internet traffic to the resources for your domain that is once your resource is being created, maybe your VPC or EC2. Now to route the traffic that is coming from the internet to this servers, you can use the route 53. So you have let's say one EC2 machine on which the Apache server and your entire website is running. Now you have a domain sample.com. So whenever a user hits to the sample.com, this is this request should be diverted to that particular server. So routing of this server from a sample.com to that particular server can be done via Route 53. Now Route 53, you cannot only just divert to a server, you can divert to multiple endpoints. Like an S3 endpoint, we have seen that S3 static web hosting, correct? So if we have a static website that you want to host on a AWS, that also you can configure with this route 53 you can just enable this route 53 endpoint to the s3 endpoint and the, all the requests will be sent to this endpoint there also you can check the health of your resources you can also check whether the endpoint on which you have connected is also available or not is healthy or not so let's say there is a load balancer application load balancer and there are four EC2 machines running behind it. And there is a domain sample.com on which this ELB endpoint is configured. All right. So now this application load balancer will first check whether that application is running or not at the back end currently. So application load balancer will continue to check whether the index.html file is there or not that part on that particular port, whether that instance is healthy or not. And if it's healthy, then it will mark as healthy. And now this route 53 will check the endpoint of the ELB. Whether when you hit the endpoint of the ELB, whether that website is available or not. So there are two kinds of health checks that you can do to make sure your website is always up and running. So check the health of your resources. You can do with route 53. Now there are certain concepts of the route that we will discuss and these are the basics of the uh, DNS service you can uh, easily find from the internet also. That is domain name and the name is such as example.com these are called as domain name. Then there are two types of domain name labels that is top level domains and generic domains. Top level domains are basically .com, .org, .net, .info all these are top level domains. And under this top level domain, there are lots of subdomains or generic domains are available. Like uh, uh, .guru.ninja.fit.club, uh, uh, these are general level domains. And then we have a domain registrar. A domain registrar is nothing but a company that is accredited by ICANN who is authorized to create a new uh, domain who is authorized to process a domain registration for its customer. So can you tell me any domain registrar company? Amazon is one of the domain registrar company. Then we have GoDaddy, Postripple, Postcatter. These all are domain registrar companies. So these domain registrar companies are accredited, are eligible to buy a domain for its customers. So now can anyone of you tell me how this domain level things or the DNS system works? Any idea on this DNS system? Sorry? How DNS system works? Uh, it uh, resolves hostname to IP and uh, vice versa IP to hostname. Correct. So that is the basic job done by this DNS system. Ma mapping of uh, friendly name system to the IP and IP to the friendly name system. 
but who does and which dna system will do this job because every single minute there are millions of requests are been sending to different browsers like from the world wide web we send each minute a millions of uh, this dna server we, we we request to for multiple domain so who does this what kind of server they are using to meet this requirement because that's for sure in india we have 1.2 billions of population in the world we have billions or trillions of populations i'm not sure so out of this if 50% of these people are continuously accessing the browser then they are hitting to a browser they uh, they do some they uh, they fire some domains uh, google.com facebook.com so who resolve this permission who resolve this ip address and if a single server does this job then what will be the size of the server and who will maintain the server i think isp will do that isp will do that okay yeah. so basically how it works once a request is sent to the browser the local isp will send the request to the root domain okay now root domain that is top level domain checks whether that domain register is within the service or not for example if you have purchased a domain from amazon then this request will be sent to the amazon to map the particular ip address running behind the at first layer the all the request goes to the top level domains so top level domains will check if the request is made through their domains or not if it is made through their domains then they will map the ip address and will respond back to the user but if they are not going to the top level domains if they are from the generic domains and the request will go down break down into their generic side so this top level and the generic level domains domain system does a mapping of name to the ip and ip to the name now there are again uh, if you know already this kind of concept uh, that's fine otherwise, otherwise i will just uh, repeat the things there are certain dns concepts like alias record and alias record is nothing but a, a record through which you can map your resources to the domain there are two types of alias record and a type record and a a a a that is four a type of record basically a uh, a type record is something that you map an ip word ip version 4 address to your domain that is google.com is mapped to 172.132.11.1 ip address but 4a type of record is ip version 6 so what kind of alias record there are two types of alias record a type and a, 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 a type of record now most of the time we use a, a type only then we have domain name system that is dns service that maps a uh, public ip uh, sorry that maps maps the name to the public ip of your server now this is the concept of a aws hosted zone similar in our s3 we have s3 bucket which is the container to store the data similarly on our route 53 we have hosted zone which is again a container that will hold the records For our domain, which means, if you have purchased a domain Google.com, then you will get one hosted zone with the name of Google.com. So once you have created this hosted zone, once you got this hosted zone, now how you want to have a transaction, you can specify in this hosted zone. You can create uh, subdomains. You can configure all the different routing options inside this hosted zone under Google.com. so for example i have four application running a drive application a mail application a photos application etc just like google google mail google drive google photos google social google plus whatever it is okay so now i have top level domain google.com so under this i have multiple application running so under this hosted zone i can configure if a request is coming to mail.google.com 
then this request should be diverted to that particular server. If a request is coming from photos.google.com, then it should be diverted to that particular server. So this filtration we can do in the hosted zone. Then we have a name server. Name server is basically provided by the domain registrar company. The more the name server you have, the more the high availability of your domain you have. Uh, how it works? Basically, GoDaddy and others uh, domain provider will give you two name server, but Amazon gives you four name server. So basically, what happens? As I told you, always the request comes first to the top level domain, and from this top level domain, it goes to the generic domain. So similarly, name servers are not top level domains. Whenever the request comes to this one of the name server, it resolves your IP address, it resolves your domain and routes the traffic to the appropriate destination now let's consider you have a four name server and one of the name server is down so what will happen the request will be sent to the another name server if the another name server is also down then the request will go to the third name server so in this way amazon maintains four name server for its route 50 section the more names server you have, the more the high ability of your domain you get. Now these are the not common domain names. These are like .net, .co, .uk, .com, .info, .net, .org, like kind of top level domains. And then we have record set. That is the things that we have discussed in the hosted zone, mail.google.com or the drive.google.com. How to create this hosted zone? How to create this record set is via this recording message. So you can write a policy. If a request is coming at mail.google.com, you can forward this link to the that particular server. You can do this in the record set. All right. Any questions? Any doubt in this part? In the DNS concepts. No. No. All right. Now comes a very important part from a certification point of view, or if you are going for an interview, then also this is very important. This is a hundred percent asked question, even in the certification. That is routing policy. There are five different routing policies available: simple routing policy, failover routing policy, geolocation routing policy, latency-based routing policy, and weighted routing policy. These are very important routing policy, which you will configure in your record set. So, what is simple routing policy? Simple routing policy used to route internet traffic to a single resource that performs a given function for your domain. For example, you have web server that serves the content, for example, .com site. Now, to understand it more clearly, you have one particular server only single server or multiple server with one load balancer and then you have one domain maybe example.com so when you want to drive all the traffic coming from the world to example.com from that server that you can go for a simple routing policy it will not check from where the request is coming what kind of request is coming it will check nothing it will just divert all the traffic that is coming to the example.com to the server that is simple routing policy there are millions of users who is requesting to your domain once the request comes to the route 53 route 53 will divert to the traffic to the one of the particular server or to a bunch of servers with a load balancer that is simple routing policy second one is a failover routing policy a failover routing policy are used when you want to create an active passive setup. Route 53 will monitor health of your primary site using health check. Now this is important when your data is very critical. And uh, for this failover routing policy, you need to maintain two different infrastructure. Maybe two different infrastructure in the same region or two different infrastructure, uh, sorry. Maybe two infrastructure in the same region or two infrastructure in different regions. 
that anything is possible. So what happens in this failover routing policy? Request comes from the users over the internet and which is diverted to the Route 53 and there are two different infrastructures maintained. Now every time this request will go to the active infrastructure. You have a bunch of servers, storage and etc. you have and all these requests will be gone to the first infrastructure that is to the active infrastructure whichever you specify. Now in case of this infrastructure goes down then the passive becomes active and all the requests will be coming or uh, now the whatever the requests are coming will be delivered to the second infrastructure which is a passive one. So it's like a more failover routing policy. You are maintaining two different infrastructure, maybe in the same region or maybe in different region, it doesn't matter. It will come the request, it will always send to the active one. But in case of active is down, then the request will be sent to the passive one. All right. Then we have latency based routing policy. It's basically that you route the traffic based on the lowest network latency available from your end user. Now this is very good example and this is a very good routing policy. If you have customers from the world, from different locations, if you have a customer, then this is the very best routing policy. How? Let's say you have users who is routing to the infrastructure, who is uh, basically route 50 will divert a traffic and then it will check the end user's location from the place where the request has been made it checks the location whether it's from Singapore whether it's from US, UK, Australia, India and based on that it will send the request to multiple infrastructure so again you need to maintain here two different infrastructure but the condition here is this infrastructure should be in different region Maybe one of the infrastructure is in India, the same replication infrastructure in US, UK, Australia. Now let's say if a user is requesting to the domain from Singapore, then whatever the nearest region available from the Singapore region to our infrastructure, the request will be made. If the latency between Singapore to Mumbai is low, then Singapore to US, then the request will come to the Mumbai infrastructure. If a request is low in the US region comparatively to UK region, then the request will go to the US region. So whatever the request is coming from the source endpoint to the destination, it will check the minimum latency and the data will be delivered there. All right, did you get this part? Any question, any doubt in this latency based routing policy? No. All right. And then we have weighted routing policy. A weighted routing policy is something like you weight the traffic based on the use cases. Like the request whenever it comes to the route 53, here you can maintain two different setup, two different infrastructure, and you can define a weight of your route. That is if a thousand requests are coming, then the starting 80% of the traffic will be delivered to the first infrastructure and 20% of the traffic will be delivered to the second infrastructure. Again, you need to maintain two different infrastructure and you can differentiate the, the weight of the, each of this routing policy. That is called as weighted routing policy. And then finally, we have geolocation routing policy. A geolocation routing policy lets you choose where your traffic will be sent based on the geographic location of the users. That is, let's say there is a US customer who is sitting to your side. So these people can be configured to reach to the US infrastructure only. Whereas when an Indian customer reaches to your domain, it should be diverted to the Indian infrastructure only. This US customers is not allowed to access the Indian infrastructure. Similarly, Indian customers is not allowed to access the US infrastructure. So based on the US, based on the location of the user, you can configure the infrastructure. I can also do this. I can design my infrastructure in US East 1 and I can hit the target to the 
singapore so whatever the singapore requests are coming it will be diverted to us region i can do that just i need a source and a destination endpoint so singapore can be my source and the destination can be us i can configure that part now a people sitting in india if i trying to access this geo location based routing policy they cannot access to this region have you ever seen this kind of uh, configuration uh, when you are trying to access any web application website and you are not allowed to access yes uh, sometimes uh, it we have seen some japanese uh, websites in india it will not be accessed yes yeah. even all the countries government site cannot be accessed outside of the government location or such this geographical location you cannot access to certain websites of a us government china government sitting in india if you know this kind of networks uh, cw networks hbo network if you guys are aware of this then you cannot access from india so when you go for hbo series uh, it says the region is not available in your country so when i click on sign in it says hbo is not uh, is now only supported in us and certain us territories so you are not allowed to do that unless uh, you can also do this like uh, cw is another network cw network that is also not accessible from india due to license restriction this content is only available in the us so automatically it detects a us location and you can you are not allowed to see that content so these are geo based routing policy that uh, that uh, restricts you to access the data now how you are getting charged for the route fee today route fee is not a free service even in your free tier so whenever you create a hosted zone you get a monthly charge for each of these hosted zone which is like half dollar per hosted zone per month very costly then you have dns queries now dns queries is like whenever a request is coming to your domain how the queries are even resolved and for each resolve of this queries you will get charged for that now one thing you can do is you can have a domain maybe on a godaddy you are getting a very cheap domain in 100 rupee or 200 rupee you are getting a domain which domain you are getting on amazon for 700 or 900 rupees so you decided to buy a domain on a godaddy then you are you know forwarding the traffic to the aws so whenever you do this kind of job that is domain on a godaddy and then you are forwarding the traffic to the aws load balancer or sc endpoint for serving each dns queries you will get charged if a single person retries your uh, you know domain for 100 times then the, all the 100 times your queries will be responded and you will get charged for each of these queries but if you have created a domain on the aws and then you have mapped to the aws services like cloudfront distribution load balancer ec2 machine pinstock then all these requests will be completely free there will be no additional charges so this is very important whenever your client asks that i have domain on this particular uh, domain registrar company so and i want i don't want to move it to the aws so at that time you can tell them if you do not do that then you will get charged for each queries you be made then you have managing domain names that is for buying a domain you need to pay an annual charge you can select one year subscription two year three year five year subscription and this will be your annual charges you can also transfer your existing domain from godaddy or any other services to the aws but for that also you need to buy for a single month at least single year at least 
all right any questions any doubt let me know if you have in this route 53 section hello are you guys tired or what no no no, no. hello we, we can move forward uh, David. okay so this is the uh, section and there are so many things that you can do if you want to buy a domain you can just click on register domain you can search for a domain like uh, from this link you can check whether you want to go dot com dot net dot org and there are different pricings available twelve dollar eleven dollar fifty nine dot io is for thirty nine dollars per month per annually annual charges dot ac forty eight dollars annually so example dot com is not available you can go for example domain info dot tv dot ninja you can select one of this add to cart here yeah, you can select that and this is something that will not charge you into your monthly bill this is something that you need to pay here just like, give me a guys one minute sure. So this is like your annual charges and you need to pay right now only it will not include in your monthly bill so you click on continue and here you need to provide your all the details personal details click on continue again and then you need to accept the condition and then click on complete purchase where you will be entitled to uh, add your credit card debit card net banking details to purchase this option and then within one minute to 24 hours you will get your domain here now in case if you want to transfer your domain you can just click on transfer domain here you can search for your domains and click on check once you do that a four digit code will be sent to your email id registered email id including the otp that otp will you need to pass you need to copy that otp and provide it here once you do that the domain will be available for you so that is transferring our domain from another registrar to the aws now again once you do this either a domain registration or transfer of domain as soon as you do in the hosted zone section you will find one hosted zone with the same name if you have purchased a like anything.com then here you will find a hosted zone with anything.com so you can click here create a hosted zone like if you don't have that i'm saying anything.com i click on create let's just assume that we have purchased one domain that is anything.com so every time whenever you create a hosted zone these two record cells will be always available to you. What is the name server? NS type, uh, type of this uh, record set is NS. And second is SOA, start of authority. Now NS record, as I told you earlier, you will get four NS record. And you can see here, this one is uh, .org, .com, .co, .uk, .net. So whenever a query is fired to anything.com, the request will first come to .org then the request will go if this is server is busy this dns endpoint is busy not able to configure your queries then the request will go to the .com or .co.uk so these are the four different name servers and then you have startup authority a startup authority having this kind of parameters it says 
that you should first go to the .org because this is the first name server which is configured. So the request will go to the .org to the then go to the hostmaster.amazon.com and there are different kinds of parameters option available that if a request is not been fulfilled then how many retries you need to make after what interval that you need to make this interval that is authority domain domain of a zone admin zone serial number refresh time retry time expiry time and negative catch in ttl so whatever your timing to leave for example if i say anything dot com now the server is not available so it will wait for some time till any dns server will resolve this query if a, if this domain is not registered if it, this domain is not available then after n number of times if it is not available then after n number of time it will pass as domain is not available the web page is not available once it reaches to this time to leave so that was start of authority you have and then you have name records all right now going ahead we can create a record set to divert our traffic whenever the request comes to anything.com how to divert our traffic to our resources that we have created the infrastructure that we have created so for that you can click on create a record set and here it says for name.anything.com that is if you want to create a subdomain or uh, if you want to take a request at the blog.anything.com feedback.anything.com mail.anything.com then you can provide that name here it's called as alias name now if you do not have if you do not want any alias if you do not want any name you can keep it naked that's allowed now there are different kinds of types available a type as we have discussed the alias type a type and a a a a type of record c name c name is basically a canonical name which is like copying a domain name from one endpoint to another endpoint let's say my server is running let's say my server is running 172 168 1.10 do you guys anyone know what is canonical record anyone aware of this <coughs> canonical name or c name multiple names exactly multiple so let's say apple abc.com and then you have abc apple.com so all different domain names is configured to a single server so if your request is sent to the abc apple.com the request will send to apple abc.com which is then diverted to the 172 1.0 so there are different companies who register all the domains that they have like abc.com abc.net abc dot org so whenever the different types of domains you have all these are registered to a common endpoint so how it does if a user heads to dot org the user the request will be diverted to dot com and this dot com will be diverted to the 172 168 similarly if a user hit to a dot net the request will go to dot com and then to 172 1.0 so in this way this becomes your canonical record Lalit? Yes. Uh, is there any limitation for C names? Is there any limitation for? C name. Means how many uh, number of C uh, No, there is no such kind of limit available. You can create multiple record set. There are approximately 50 different records. Okay. Okay. 
and depending upon the different kind of application that you are running there are different kinds of uh, record sets are also available if you are dealing with any mail services then you can go with the mail exchange text pointer there are different kinds of services are available but now for the most of the cases when you are having the aws resources you can go with the a type of record so now again you have two options do you want to allies or no what it means basically if you are running a single server just a single server on which you want to divert a traffic then you can select a ally record type no and here you can specify the public ip address of your ec2 machine just like this 192.168 or whatever the ip address is you can specify the ip address and here you can click on create so what will happen whenever the request comes to the anything.com this ip address will be hit it and the whatever the application is running on this side this side will be requested the server will be requested to respond the data this only works if you have on a single server when you have a bunch of server at the time you can select an allies record and at the time you can select one of the elp that is load balancer so as of now we don't have any load balancer so it will not give us that load balancer option if you have application load balancer you will find a list of application load balancer when you have a classic load balancer you will get a list of all the classic load balancer whatever you have you can select this one of the target machine there and then click on save now if you do not have it will not work so you need to specify that thing and click on save routes it will work what let me do one thing so currently this infrastructure is in mumbai and i am creating a dummy load balancer which will not have anything mumbai next next to next to preview and create and similarly the same i will do in north virginia that is i have two different infrastructure let's say doing the same configuration again just a dummy load balancer review okay so now if i go to my route section click on create route set click on allies now i must get here a load balancer but let me just refresh create yes okay now you can see here we have a uh, application load balancer here mumbai so i can select here mumbai and click on now this is simple routing policy i can click on here so now if i have 10 or 50 thousands of server running behind this load balancer each request that is coming to anything.com will be diverted to this load balancer all right so this is simple routing policy with the allies record of your endpoint any question in doubt in this simple routing policy then we create another record set and this time we'll go with a weighted routing policy that is we will wait between two infrastructure let's say my first infrastructure which is a very big infrastructure is mumbai infrastructure i can specify this is 70 percent of weight to here say mumbai 
primary. Do you want to evaluate health target? Do you want to associate the health target? In case if you want to go, you can specify this target health will cost you extra. Health targets are chargeable. So now what will happen? 70% of this traffic will be delivered to my Mumbai infrastructure. Click on create. Now we need to also allocate the 30% of our traffic. So I will create one more record set. Specify in the North Virginia. And here I will say weighted routing policy with remaining 30% of the weight. So in this way, the weight will be maintained 70% and the 30%. What if the requests are coming? 70% will be delivered to the Mumbai region and 30% will be delivered to the North Virginia. Okay. Let me know if you have any questions in this part. This is a weighted routing policy. Then we have latency based routing policy so latency is basically you are having a multiple infrastructure and based on the source of the user's request the latency will be checked and the least latency provider will get the request so let's say i have another region called as mumbai region and let's say this is my active region so now to evaluate the latency between two regions, we must create a health check. So at this time, it will check from the source IP that the request that is coming to the AP South one will having a low traffic or creating another region in the North Virginia with the latency. That is US East one. We say it as SEO region. So now it will check the if a request is now coming from Singapore. If the latency between Singapore and India is low, then the request will be definitely delivered to the India. But due to some reason, if the data center is down or is having a problem with the latency issues, then definitely it will go to the US East one. So depending upon the latency, depending upon the region, it, the request will be made. Now, of course, if a request is coming from the US, the request will not come to India unless the US region or the infrastructure is down. At that time only, the request will come to India. Otherwise, all the requests will be served to a US region only. So in this way, you can go with the latency-based routing policy. Next, we have the failover. Now, failover, you can go with a single region or multiple region. That's up to you. That is, let's say, my Mumbai is my primary one. Create. Okay, for this, you must require a health target. You need to create a health target and associate that health target. So, it will check the health of your uh, primary infrastructure. If the primary infrastructure is active, is able to accept all the conditions is accept is uh, allowed to accept all the requests made by the server from the internet then the request will go to the primary one otherwise you will have a secondary infrastructure in case of failure of the first one this becomes your secondary you can select the secondary right so due to any reason if the primary goes down then the request will be sent to the secondary that is active passive relationship. And finally, we have geo based routing policy. There you can maintain the geo location. Let's say my infrastructure is Mumbai and I go with a geo based log location. So, from where which location the query should be made? Let's say from the all the European nations can reach to my website. So all need the European nations can head to my infrastructure, which is located in Mumbai. 
that we can do. These are the different routing policies that you can set. Now for sure, one of the question will be asked, at least one question will be asked in the exam about this routing policy. Let me know if you have any doubt related to this route. Hello. Yeah, we can move forward now. All right. So before moving ahead, like it's already one o'clock. So let's just take a lunch break and then we can continue. Okay. okay. Yeah. Uh, next session, what are the other topics you want to cover, Ravi? Uh, we'll like to cover the cloud formation, cloud watch, cloud trail, then application services, all three, Lambras and well architecture framework. These are basically very short, short topics we can cover. Okay. Fine then. Uh, what time you want to meet up like again? Uh, two o'clock or one thirty, one forty-five? Uh, two o'clock sharp. Uh, it seems to be a long break because uh, we do not want to you know get into that sick you know till six o'clock can that be like you know start like maybe 15 bits uh, earlier like maybe around 145 is that okay yeah sure fine it's already 12 45 now mm -hmm. we can start yeah, yeah. just we'll take one hour break yeah and then yeah so before yeah, if you, you. Are, uh, just one more thing if you are trying to create an institution for the practice worker Make sure you delete it before 12 hours is completed. Otherwise, you will get a charge for that. If you want to do the lab session and that if you delete it within 12 hours, then you will All right. And I would have one more suggestion for you. Like whenever you do the lab practices, uh, make sure you do some kind of troubleshooting. Whenever you face any problem, you can just go to the AWS documentation and try to figure out that problem. The reason behind it, if you do more and more this kind of troubleshooting things, 10% of the question in the exams are dependent on the troubleshooting. So you can easily crack this troubleshooting basic question if you are well with your lab session. So more that you do the lab session, this 10% question you can easily crack in the exam. All right, so let's just, uh, see, I see you again at uh, 145. All right. Okay. Okay. okay.